I know we have a certain theme going today, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But I want to start by noting that 100 years ago today, the armistice was signed that ended World War I. That was a war that caught up this country into a war fervor that caused many to despise certain immigrants, immigrants who came from a certain part of the world and know it wasn't Central America. It was where my ancestors came from and uh, many of you, Germany. We even renamed streets and landmarks and whole towns that had names with unfortunate German connections. You know, Liberty Street that runs south through downtown Harrisonburg, our friendly city, renamed it during this war. Before that, it was called German Street. Many Mennonites refused to fight in this war in obedience to their conscience and to the church. And since no alternative service was available, their only choice was to be non-cooperative. And since American Mennonites at that time were mostly of German ancestry, this was a very hard time for them. A little story that actually connects with this morning's theme. My grandfather, Loy Niss, who now rests in peace about three miles from here in the Weaver's Mennonite Cemetery, was a 21-year-old CO in Army boot camp in Georgia. Almost exactly 100 years ago, on a Sunday morning, a few weeks before the armistice was signed, he was given permission by his commanding officer to roam the extensive grounds of Camp Greenleaf in Fort Oglethorpe. All along, he was given the impression that he was the only CO in camp, and he felt very alone as he suffered a great deal of persecution and humiliation. But this Sunday morning, he was on a quest to find other COs. At the far corner of the camp, he saw a little map on a building that identified a small compound as Conscientious Objector Detachment. So he went directly toward that compound, and as he approached the large canvas tent, he heard singing. And he stopped in his tracks when he recognized the songs, hymns he had grown up singing in church. He was so overcome with emotion that he hid behind a woodpile and just listened and wept until he could compose himself and walk into that tent and introduce himself to that group of COs gathered to worship on a Sunday morning. I think that until he died, he would look back on that experience of worship as one of the more meaningful and memorable in his life. We started out this service singing a song we love called, What is This Place? Yes, really, what is this place? The song says, only a house, the earth its floor, walls and a roof sheltering people, windows for light and open door. The church in the army tent that my grandfather encountered literally had the earth as its floor. Canvas walls and a roof sheltered them. Not many windows for light, but an open tent flap welcomed my grandfather. It doesn't take much, actually, to house a church. So why? Why would we have just spent so much of our precious resources to save this particular house? What is this place that we would go to this length to renovate it? I grew up going to a church that looked like a salt box. No decoration, no color, no worship arts, no cross, no candle just white-painted cement block walls. 
straight and hard wooden benches and a simple pulpit up front. In another church of my childhood, in St. Petersburg, Florida, the congregation worshiped in the basement, on folding chairs with a concrete floor and no windows. While in the main sanctuary, one floor above us was a life-size model of Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness, complete with velvet drapes and beautiful, ornate worship furnishings. But we didn't worship in that space. We gave tours. But that's a whole story for another time. The point is, I was formed by a church that gave very little thought to its physical surroundings. They asked the same question as our opening hymn, although maybe a little more critically. What is this place? What? Nothing, really, except a floor and a roof and walls. The place doesn't matter. It's the people inside who do. It's what happens inside. It what's, it's what happens when we leave that really matters. I was formed by a church that read a verse like Hebrews 9.24 that we heard earlier today. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, and saw that as a text that diminished the importance of physical space, even though that is not really what that text is doing. This is the view of church that has profoundly shaped me. And actually, I'm grateful for that. Really. It has kept me rightfully skeptical of churches that care more about the color of the carpet and the drapes than they do about the well-being of the worshiper sitting next to them or of their neighbor across the street from the church building. It has also given me a great appreciation for the value and the validity of churches in our own country and around the world who meet outside under trees, or in homes, or in storefronts, or in most any available place. They are legitimately church, every bit as much as we are with our tall and picturesque steeple that almost wasn't. <laughs> this view of church that shaped me helped me, in fact, to accept the possibility that we might not have had a steeple in our future, even though I was hoping we would. Simplicity is good. Functionality is good. Face-to-face -face church in homes and under trees is good, and in some ways can be even better. But let me restate the message of that song we sang in what I think is a more complete way that is true to the scripture that we heard today. I only read you the first half of the first verse, and yes, this place is only a floor, roof, walls, windows, and doors. But there's more. Yet it becomes a body that lives when we are gathered here and know our God is near. And this mere place helps shape this body. Helps the body become something more than it would have been otherwise. Here's the second verse. Words from afar, stars that are falling, sparks that are sown in us like seed, names for our God, dreams, signs, and wonders, that whole list of things that we sang are, quote, sent from the past and are what we need. Here in this place, we remember and speak again what we have heard, God's free redeeming word. See, this place is not a neutral, unimpactful place. 
It is a place where life-shaping things happen. It's a place where the whole sweep of God's activity in history is remembered and retold and rehearsed and reenacted in a way that shapes us to the core. But this life-shaping activity of corporate worship and fellowship is not for us alone. It is for the world. Third verse, and we accept bread at this table, broken and shared, a living sign. Here in this world, dying and living, we are each other's bread and wine. This is the place where we can Receive what we need to increase God's justice and God's peace. Wow. We are here in this place together so that we can remember who God is and who we are through the age-old practices of Christian life and Christian worship so that we can go out through these open doors and live as bread and wine pouring ourselves out, as Christ did, in a world of great need, so that God's justice and God's peace will come about as God intends. Now, if we as a congregation did not really care about the world around us, then I would feel entirely different about this building that houses us. But because I believe we get it, mostly, because we understand that the church does not exist for itself but for the world, then I can and do wholeheartedly and unapologetically say that fixing this building is an investment in God's kingdom because it shapes us as partners in the mission of God. That is not to say that churches who de-emphasize buildings or who meet in humble abodes out of choice or out of necessity, that those churches are in any way, shape, or form inferior to ours or any less legitimate as a church on mission with God. No, no, no. I spent too much of my childhood in salt box churches and basement dwelling churches who are full of life and engaged in mission. And I began my pastoral ministry in a church that first met in a living room and then in a hotel conference room and, and then in a borrowed Methodist chapel. And was nevertheless an amazing congregation with a wide impact on its community. So no, I will never suggest that we do it better here at Parkview, but I will also not apologize for this substantial and beautiful, and expensive, and now more safe and healthy and sustainable building. Because we are using it in the same way that other ch churches use what they have for their home, as a base of operations for our calling in this world. I believe that. In case anyone here still imagines that we have just spent one and a half million dollars on ourselves. Let me quickly disabuse you of that false notion. A couple weeks ago, I got to the end of the week and I just thought back about what happened here in this space just that week. And I was amazed, so I added it up. In case you think this building is mainly a place to get together on Sunday mornings to worship and fellowship, here are the facts about what happened here during the week of October 21. That was while there was still construction going on in the downstairs every day. After we left the building on Sunday morning, October 21, an adult class had a potluck meal with 30 plus people. Our choir met in this space to practice with over 40 people. We had a coming of age ceremony with probably 50 people, including our guests, honoring our young people. Our children gathered to practice for their upcoming Christmas musical, and probably they practiced the song they sang this morning. 
I'm guessing 20 or more with adults. Kids Club happened with 30 or more children from our neighborhood, plus 10 or so of our own children, plus adult le leaders for over 50 in the fellowship hall, singing and playing, listening to a Bible story, and working together, eating a healthy snack, and being loved. And our junior youth gathered for a games night to build relationships. All told, as many as 250, 40, 240 people walked into and out of this building to engage in programs and activities that we planned and led. But wait, there's more. We had a men's Bible study one morning that week with 70 or so men from around the community present. And 15 or so women from all over the area showed up to exercise together in a yoga class twice. That's 100 more people who walked into and out of this building engaging in activities that we plan in partnership with the community around us. That brings the number to 340. But wait, there's more. We opened our group to multiple groups of other people who needed a physical space like ours to carry out their mission. There was not one, not two, not three, but four different musical groups that met to rehearse in the space that week, in addition to our adult and children's choir. Eight persons in Cantore, 50 or more in the Shenandoah Valley Choral Society, six in good company, and over 50 adults and children in the Valley Community Choir who gave their concerts here last night and the night before. And we opened our fellowship hall to Pleasant View Incorporated, a nonprofit serving individuals with disabilities for their annual fundraising banquet. And there were about 175 people seated in the fellowship hall. And 15 or so cooks and servers in the kitchen. So let's see, that's over 300 more people that walked into and out of this building that week. This was an ordinary week in October. Nothing unusual about that activity level. Most of those things happen here every week. Around the holidays, those numbers will go up considerably. But I just counted 650 people, children and adults, from all walks of life, different language groups, different religions or no religion, different socioeconomic status, who walked into and out of our building that week for organized activities intended to bring them together and to serve the needs of our community. Notice I did not count the several hundred who gathered for worship Sunday morning, nor the 50 or so children and parents and teachers who come and go every day in the early learning center downstairs, nor the random individuals who stop by our office for any number of reasons and needs. That total number then would be well over a thousand. I hope there are not too many people who will honestly reflect on those facts and numbers who know the high cost of making this building healthy and safe and welcoming for all who will still be tempted to suggest ever that we just spent one and a half million dollars on ourselves. The facts simply do not support that notion. Since we moved back into this building in September, I've been taking lots of deep breaths. <sighs> and they are breaths of awe, of amazement, and gratitude. I've noticed literally how much easier the air is to breathe. It is. And I wasn't one that had sensitivity to what was here before. I've noticed that people who use this space simply use it without realizing what all has gone into this place to make their activity, their ministry possible. And I'm okay with them not knowing. They don't need to know and don't need to worry about it. 
giving them a worry-free and safe and comfortable space for them to carry out their work is a gift that we as a church are uniquely able to offer. Not every congregation is blessed with such a space. So I'm glad we have it. And I'm so glad we are generous with it. And I'm so glad for the generosity of all of you that makes this reality possible. So I can't think of anything better to do right now than to stand and sing a song of praise and thanksgiving to God. Turn in hymnal worship book number 112, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth.